Welcome, this is Terry, host of the CPI podcast series Unrestrained. Today, in celebration of Father's Day, I'll be doing a feature interview with a Milwaukee native and Alzheimer's caregiver, Tim Goss. Hello and welcome, Tim. Hello. Tim and his father, Tom, have been featured twice before in popular CPI blogs, so today is the third in the series of this fascinating look into person-centered care given from the perspective of an immediate family member. In many ways, Tim's approach has reflected the key aspects of the Warchol Best Abilities model, something he became aware of through contact with Kim Warchol, but practiced in his own way before becoming aware of it as a defined care model. Tim received his B.S. in Material Science and a B.A. in English from UW-Madison and his Master's of Arts in Teaching from the National College of Education and taught bilingual kindergarten at Milwaukee Public Schools from throughout the 1990s. Following a career change into creative visual productions, Tim became a full-time caregiver for his father in 2008. Tim's father had been diagnosed with dementia, and Tim's care journey took him through all stages of his father's dementia experience. Today's interview will focus on Tom's love of music, his death, and the ultimate affirmation of remaining abilities. So Tim, in many ways, your father lived a very successful and somewhat remarkable life that can easily be seen in your wonderful video and the photographs of Tom from across the decades. Could we start today with a brief biographical sketch of your father, Tom Goss? Sure. My dad was the fourth of six children born in the 1920s in Milwaukee, and they, uh, he grew up in, basically in the downtown area near State Street. And uh, his father, throughout his childhood, had steady, steady employment working for uh, NML, Never missed a day of work, curiously. Uh, uh, it was a very tight home, but there was also issues there, too, with my, with my grandma, uh, who had early mental issues. Anyhow, uh, he, he, went to, he attended school in Milwaukee, a grade school and high school, then went on to attend Marquette University. Uh, in his freshman year at Marquette University, though, he had taken a particular interest in learning how to fly. So every day after class in the fall semester, he would hitchhike out to Timmerman Field and get lessons on flying. Uh, and then soon after that, he qualified as a young pilot and was recruited by the, uh, the military to enlist for World, World War II, and he eventually joined the Marine Corps. He served uh, as a dive bomber in World War II in the uh, South Pacific arena, basically going on uh, the maximum number of missions, target missions, in the uh, in targeting the Philippines. He was there on the very, very first day of the liberation of the Philippines, uh, representing the Marine Corps. Anyhow, uh, he returned from World War II in 1945 and immediately enrolled back into Marquette University where he eventually completed his undergraduate degree in engineering. Then he started uh, law school there in about 1950 and was immediately, that was immediately interrupted by a request from the military to go back into the service voluntarily for the Korean War. Uh, so he to fly for them again to fly for them they basically uh, were sort of caught with their pants down essentially they had not trained a new group of Marine Corps dive bombers not because they were not expecting another conflict so soon I see. so they asked all their previous flyers if they would consider coming back for the Korean War and my dad and many of his friends agreed to do that without much hesitation so he went back to Korea uh, he went back to the military and served in Korea, again doing his maximum number of missions over the course of about two years, and then uh, was basically uh, informed that he would soon be leaving the service because of the, uh, accomplishing the maximum number of missions, came back to the United States, and in the military, until the day you are actually formally discharged from the military, they train you and carry on like you're full-time. So he was actually training in Carolina upon returning from the Korean War uh, one day uh, when he had a, his single engine plane, the engine died, and he crashed in a very uh, almost jungle-like area in North Carolina. And as a result of that, uh, a year and a half later, they eventually had to amputate his leg. 
He then came back to Milwaukee, uh, finished his law degree in 1956, and immediately started working for the Alice Chalmers Corporation. By this time, he had three children and a fourth on the way. Uh, incidentally, he had also been married in 1952. <laughs> <laughs> Just for point of clarity. Yes. How many children ultimately did you guys have? Uh, there were se there were seven children in the family, and uh, who were born between 1952 and 1966. But mm -hmm. anyhow, so he started. Uh, he quickly learned how to carry on in life uh, as an amputee. He did have some very good mentoring from some uh, amputees, uh, veteran amputees here in Milwaukee. Very critical help uh, early on, and uh, really had. Uh, a very normal life as a father and a, uh, and a working a, adult. I see. And uh, as I was growing up, I always thought that every father <laughs> had one leg because that's, <laughs> that's what I saw and that's what he portrayed too, that that was normal. So that's, he was very at peace with his situation. Mm -hmm. And remained athletic with it too, didn't he? As best he could, as yes. He'd he do a lot of swimming and things like that. Right. So, uh, so, that's a, so we get a good sketch of this guy. Uh, Fought hard in the war. Didn't need. Did, did was not asked to reenlist, and he did it uh, cheerfully. Lost his leg. Became a lawyer. Raised a family. Now, how, what is a situation where you would start to become a full time caregiver for Tom later in his life? Yeah. Fast forward to uh, during his later retirement when he in his mid eighties, uh, I was living nearby, and I just noticed certain lapses in his brain functioning, and. Uh, started getting more involved in his day-to-day -day life just to make sure that he was safe. Mm -hmm. but the rest of the family concurred that something was going on, so we kept a close eye on it and uh, worked with the VA about it too. And eventually we determined that he should go into a, a that, that he and my mother would do better, they would prosper more in a care facility where there are services there, but still in a, an independent living arrangement. Uh, they chose the Milwaukee Catholic Home. They were very happy to come here. And once they moved into the Catholic Home, I pretty much moved in myself and uh, picked the couch for sleeping every night and have been doing that for probably about six and a half years. I see. And, uh, and, as, this, and as your father progresses in his dementia, your role, I imagine, he gets more and more demanding. Yes. It was very uh, s slow changes that happened, very mm -hmm. slow changes that occurred. And so I was able to kind of make the adjustments as we went along. The good thing is we got along wonderfully, my parents and I, before this. So this was all kind of very fun to be in each other's company. Mm -hmm. And my father slowly yielded sort of controlled decision making on very simple things to me as time went on and he became more compromised. Mm -hmm. And most critically trusted me in, in uh, my leadership basically of, of helping him to be safe and enjoy his life. How did you, uh, well, besides the, besides taking him flying again, how was some other ways you celebrated his remaining abilities? I mean, people can look, there's a blog here, which will point to here where Tim actually took his father up, uh, it, it, with some advanced dementia into a two seater plane and Tom not only flew, but the, the plane by himself, but landed it. So we'll put a link to that as well. But what are some of the other, abilities driven activities that you would do with your father well he always loved music uh, from early on he just loved music he first learned how to sing when my grandfather would uh, get up every morning uh, for work go into the bathroom and shave and he would make his two sons come in and <laughs> sing with him all right he made him there was no choice involved okay. and my dad at the time was probably six or seven and so my grandfather would sing a, a melody. Uh, one I remember is The World is Waiting for the Sunshine or something like that, uh, the Les Paul song. Okay. Uh, and he taught my father and my uncle how to sing harmony. And so my dad is one of those singers who, uh, who just naturally hears a harmony part. Uh, coincidentally, he also had a phenomenal voice, which his grandfather did not have, nor his siblings. He had sort of the archetypal Irish tenor, higher... Totally. Yeah, he was beautiful. It was singer. all there. Anyhow, so uh, he had a love for music, which he pursued throughout his life. He was involved in grade school and in high school and choirs and stuff like that. Uh, he would always sing at parties, everything. You know, he just, he just loved singing... Uh, I would say even more than listening to music. He just loved to sing. Mm -hmm. Eventually that uh, 
evolved into him being in the church choir when we finally got our one home. And uh, he continued that throughout his adult life, singing. So I, uh, I purposely tried to emphasize music. Now, I eventually became a musician, and he was quite delighted with that. And so when I was taking care of him, I was very vigilant about including my music with him. I would write songs in front of him. I would write songs for him. I would perform. I did a lot of concerts here. There was a, and I also played a lot of um, the music that he and my mother listened to uh, in their young adult life, uh, basically billboard hits from the 40s and 50s. I purposely went out and sought that and found a, a 10 CD collection and played it night and day here. And it just delighted them to hear that stuff. So um, I did use the music component. He also loved to swim, so I would take him swimming uh, three to five times a week at his usual pool, and then uh, towards the end of his life at a pool that was nearby the Catholic home that worked well for him. Now, uh, uh, there's a song that uh, is behind the... Um, now, you talked about writing songs that your father liked. There is a song which is the bed track for the video that you saw, uh, could you talk about writing that song and how that became so special to Tom? Yes. In the uh, late 80s, I had the good fortune of stumbling into a black gospel church and immediately fell in love with the music and essentially invited myself into the band and got immersed in black gospel music. Uh, several years later, I ended up writing a gospel song called Hold On, which was very melodic, uh, a pretty melody, and my dad just immediately latched onto that song. It, it just soon became his favorite, and every time I would see him, he would ask me to sing that song to him. <laughs> That's beautiful. Uh, to his dying day. In fact, in his, in his dying days, I went into the studio and recorded it with um, one of the lead singers from my local gospel group uh, so that he would have that song in his room. And that ties in with our question here. Um, the Warchill Best Ability model emphasizes ability at every level, and, and you have a beautiful story about the expression of ability, uh, Tom's ability in his last days concerning that music. And could you share that with us? Sure. During the last week of during the last week of my father's life, uh, on a Monday, the doctors basically stated that he was now in a coma. And so all the family assembled the following day on a Tuesday and went to his room in the special care unit and s sort of held vigil with him there. The whole time he was in bed, obviously oblivious, at least to our presence as far as we knew, uh, when we would look down at him and his eyes were open, he would look right through us. In other words, it wouldn't mm -hmm. register in his eyes that we were there. But the whole family was there. I got there and I just... It felt very crowded, and of course, it was very challenging for me, and I just wasn't in the mood for spending much time there. So I left. Uh, later that early evening, I went and picked up a friend at the airport, and on the way home, asked her if she would be interested in visiting my father, whom she had known throughout her life. And she was very excited about doing that, so we went back up to his room. It was very different when I walked in there. The light was off. There was a small night light on next to his bed. He was curled to his side, struggling to breathe, struggling tremendously to breathe um, with a respirator. So your father is at the very, very end stage of dementia here, and it's about to claim him. Uh, yeah, dementia okay. was okay. killing him. He, okay. was, he was dying. Sure. Uh, and that was the first time I had ever gone to my father's room where I just didn't know what to do. Like, wow. I always had a trick mm -hmm. for, for grabbing his attention, redirecting him, getting him to focus on something mm -hmm. positive and real. Uh, so I looked at my friend, and I just said, I, you know, boy, I don't know what to do. And then I thought, hmm, sing a song. So I immediately thought of my dad's favorite song of mine. And I knelt down next to him. His face was about a foot and a half away from me. And I started singing this song to him. And I got to the second from last line, and all along his eyes had been shut, and then suddenly they popped open. That was quite remarkable. <laughs> but then I looked at his eyes, and, and I could tell immediately he saw me. It wasn't that vacant stare. He was looking right at me, and his eyes were basically smiling at me. 
Hmm. And I was just blown away by this. And uh, of course, I felt oblig obliged to finish the song. So I did, and I got to the end of the song, and he broke into a smile. <laughs> and he just had this big, long smile at me, uh, looking at me. And I was stunned by all of this. Hmm. And then he puckered his lips twice and gave me two kisses at the end of the song. Wow. And I was just shocked. I looked up at my friend after that, and then he closed his eyes again. Looked up at my friend and said, did this just happen? And she said, absolutely. I was here. I saw it. It did. It. And I knew my father was dying, so I made the decision right then and there that that was the last time I was going to see him. So I stood up to leave, looked down at my father one more time, and made one last observation which just blew me away. His breathing had normalized. It was completely normal. He was sleeping and breathing just very normally. And uh, I felt very good about that, and I left. And I went home and told my mom the story, uh, asked for her permission not to visit my dad again, and she was all for that. Mm -hmm. So that's the last time I actually saw him. He gave me that gift. Well, what a what a thank you, Tim. Uh, what a what a tremendous story about the remaining ability that Tom had to recognize you and the music and to embrace you, as one of the the last things the last thing that you remember is your father and him being at peace. Well, the, um, my guest today has been Timothy Goss. Thank you so much for this reminiscence, Tim. Sure. All right, uh, and that will conclude our interview today. <laughs>